most likely. Uh, this week, we're going to pick up where we left off last week for Easter Sunday. And as I had mentioned before, uh, we're not necessarily going to be going back into the little chunk of Luke that we missed because uh, where we find ourselves, I think, is, is a helpful place to just kind of launch into our summertime series. We've got a few weeks left in Luke, and then we're going to have a little transition point. And then we're going to head to the book of Revelation. Now, again, I want to make something very clear about our time going into this book. This morning, you should listen up really, really clearly. Listen up really, really clearly, because what we're talking about today has everything to do with what the book of Revelation says. Okay? The whole point of what Luke is talking about is saying, see how the Bible points to Jesus? See how the Bible points to Jesus over and over and over again? The whole point of Revelation is the same thing as the whole point of the entire Bible, which is look at Jesus. Look at the conquering lamb. Look at the one who has risen from the dead. Look at the one who is reigning at the right hand of the father. Look at the one who is sustaining his people through a very troubled world that is getting worse and worse and worse until the end comes. That's the whole point of Revelation. So please listen because you will do yourself a terrible disservice if you walk away from looking at the Bible in any capacity, whether it's the Old Testament, whether it's Revelation, whether it's the Gospel of Luke, whatever it might be. You'll do yourself a terrible disservice if you look at the Bible and you leave reading it with the idea that somehow there's something deeper or more to be discovered in the Bible than the gospel itself. Now, there are depths to the gospel that are tremendously beautiful and wonderfully clear and mineable and enjoyable in every different level. But the point of the Bible is to point you to Jesus. And if what you've taken from the Bible at any point does not point you to Jesus, you are missing the point. Good deal? Thumbs up. Good. I'm glad you're excited about that. I'm trusting you are. Luke 24, 13 through 27, Luke, the gospel-centered physician. We're going to wrap up our time with our good friend Luke in a few weeks, as I said, and this is where we are going to be headed. Um, I think we're going to, we have a, maybe we don't have a malfunction here again. Let's see. We're going to need Levi. You're going to be Johnny on the spot for me, unless I can finagle something with, uh, with our little clicker here. And uh, if you could please go to our next slide. It'd be wonderful. You're trying. Oh, hey, there we go. Winning. Thank you. Good job, Levi. All right, pick it up. Verse 13. This is after the resurrection has been witnessed by some beloved women who are going to care for the body of Jesus. That very day, Easter Sunday, that very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. And one of them named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it, just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O oh, foolish ones! And slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So here's your big idea for the morning. The unexpected gospel, because we've seen this theme repeatedly, that Luke wants us to, to see things that happen in an unexpected capacity, whether it's the coming of Jesus into the world, whether it is the people that Jesus interacts with, whether it's the way that Jesus does things, it's unexpected, okay? Much different the expectations we have of what it would look like for God to deal with people. So the unexpected gospel is wholly about an unexpected savior whose word has and will always lead directly to him. It's pretty to the point 
as I open up with, it's just, this is, this is what you need to take away from this. Absolutely what you need to take away from this, this morning, because I, 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 I don't want to sound like I'm making grandiose promises that can't be kept, but this is the, I'll use, I'll use something that'll pique your curiosity. This is the key to the entire Bible. Okay, this is the key to the entire Bible. Uh, there are people who will come up with bizarre ideas, and I want to I want to convince you this is not a bizarre idea because this is the idea that Jesus wants you to see. He goes to these disciples, he's talking to these disciples, they're on this road together, and they've got this confusion. And I I would suggest to you the reason why they're confused is because they don't understand this. Because they looked at the Bible and they saw a whole bunch of different things, so many different ideas about uh, how would God deal with people? How would God interact with people? And over and over and over again, people make terrible mistakes in their effort to understand who Jesus is. And so as Jesus interacts with these disciples on this resurrection day, he goes to them and he's like, okay, I'm going to tell you this whole thing is about me. Starting with Moses and all the prophets, everything that you know about this Bible, and these were good Jewish boys who knew their scriptures, they knew what was said. Jesus saying, you know what was said? Well, this is about me. This is where we're going this morning. So adventures in missing the point. We're going to look at some adventures in missing the point here. Give a little survey of some things that happened and escalated pretty severely. So again, very day two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you were holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. So note here, they're looking sad, but I, 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 would, I would argue that they're not simply sad because Jesus was crucified. There's more to it than that in their sadness. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. So, they have a sadness in their voice, sadness, and how they're carrying themselves as they're talking to the resurrected Jesus. And as they're speaking to him, they, they mention something. And there's a word, and you think, what happens when your hope, it's like a balloon, and a little pin comes, and a pin comes and pops your hope balloon. And it feels really bad. If you're hopeful about something, and your hope balloon gets, you feel sad. Okay, and I would I would suggest to you that these disciples persisted even to this point, persisted in a belief about who Jesus was that was not helpful, and it wasn't helpful to the very point that it led them to basically believe that Jesus had failed. Now, just imagine what this must have been like for these people who spent a few years walking with Jesus in this world, a few years walking with him, they had seen him do so many things, and then it seems like everything has come crashing to the ground, has failed miserably, and there's nothing left. They have no hope. They had put their hope in Jesus, and it seemed to them that Jesus had failed. Perhaps you have had that experience yourself. I know I have had that type of experience where in my, my emotions, I'm feeling Jesus, where, where are you to step in to help this? I, I really need you to take care of this for me. Now, Jesus takes care of his people. He takes care of things for his people so beautifully and so wonderfully. But many times, it's in ways different than we expect him to meet our needs. So for these disciples, they were sad. And they were sad not simply because Jesus had died. They were sad because with Jesus' death, it seemed as though their hope in who Jesus was, was destroyed. So here's a point. Even after all had been said and done, and the women had witnessed the resurrection itself, the disciples were still distracted from understanding what it meant for the Christ to redeem his people. Now notice that as, as they're talking to Jesus, their hope, he says, we were hoping he would be the one to redeem Israel. So there's a little 
little picture into their minds. Look, redeem. We wanted Jesus to redeem Israel. And it seemed like that had failed miserably. It seemed like it had failed miserably because in Jesus's death, it seemed like redemption was impossible. So we're going to get to that in a little bit. But I want you to see here how this has been a consistent theme in the lives of everybody pertaining to Jesus. In Luke 7, this is what we saw a number of months back. The disciples of John reported all these things to him. So as, as these, these signs that Jesus was carrying out to show that he is who he is, he's been doing these things and he's, he is doing remarkable things, things that had never been done before in the history of the world, things that had never been done before. It's being reported to John and John had been imprisoned. John had been put in a, in a, in a, in a cell awaiting his execution ultimately because of his commitment to righteousness, his commitment to honoring God with his whole life. And he's waiting there and, and he has a moment where he's thinking, oh, this is not going well. This is not going well for me at all. I thought things were going to be different. Because I, I remember, guys, you know, remember when I was out in the wilderness saying, I'm preparing the way for the Lord. Remember when that happened? Remember when I said that he's going to come and he's going to baptize with fire? I mean, he's, 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 going to, he's going to judge the living and the dead. Remember when I said that, guys? I'm not too sure now. I'm hearing these things happening, but I don't quite know if my hope is rightly placed. And so John has this interaction as he hears these things that have been going on. He sends his disciples. This is what goes on. John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to the Lord, saying, are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And when the, man, when, when the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? In that hour, he healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits, and on many who were blind, he bestowed sight. And he answered them, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor of good news preached to them, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. So John, whom Jesus has said, there is no one born among women who is greater than John the Baptist. This is an important guy. And you think, here is a man whose faith is imitable. Here is a man whom you can look at and say, what, what, what a picture, what a portrait of godliness is John the Baptist. And even John the Baptist has his moment here where he has expectations about who Jesus is and who he would be. And he's just thinking, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't. Guys, can you please go find out for me? Can you please do that? I don't know. I want to find out if my hope is rightly placed. They come back and they report this to John and John is, his fears are assuaged and he's, he's okay. Okay. It's rightly placed. It's rightly placed. He's, he's, he's unique though. He's unique in his response because we're going to see some other people here respond a little differently. Luke chapter nine, it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him and he asked them, who do the crowd say that I am? And they answered John the Baptist, but others say Elijah and others that one of the prophets of old is risen. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered the Christ of God. So it's really intimate exchange that Jesus has with disciples. And as he's talking to the disciples, he's, he's, he's praying and he's saying, guys, who, who do people say that I am? And I, I want you to hear in this, this is Jesus being the perpetual teacher. This is Jesus who is always teaching his people. And he has a point that is going to be made here. And, and this point is going to be made as, as God, the father reveals to Peter, this marvelous confession of Jesus's identity as the Christ. But as Jesus talks to them, he asks this question, they respond, well, here are the different things people saying about you, Jesus. Uh, Jesus is John the Baptist. The spirit of John the Baptist is another person. Okay. Uh, Jesus is Elijah. Maybe Jesus is Moses. They think of these different ideas like, well, reincarnation, like, Okay, it's not a biblical concept, but they're like, oh, who are, who are you? Who is this guy? Seems pretty remarkable what's happening here in the life and ministry of this Jesus. And it just illustrates this broad variety of things that people thought. And it's not too different 
from what you might encounter with people that you talk to and go to your workplace, talk to people in a, in a store, you just talk to a cashier. Say, anybody ever invite you to church before? You ever do that? And they say, well, I grew up going to church. You might ask a follow-up question, you know, what do you think about Jesus? You hear a whole variety of responses. People say all kinds of different things. A lot of times in our culture, well, Jesus was a good teacher. Okay, we'll put that over here. It's a category. People thinking Jesus is a good teacher. All right. Some people will say, and this is one of the most ridiculous things that you find around Easter, is you'll have people who show up. And there's a gentleman, uh, Bart Ehrman. He's, if you ever hear a name Bart Ehrman, don't listen to him. Okay, don't listen to him at all. Bart Ehrman is a heretic. We'll just say it for what it is. He's a heretic. And Bart Ehrman, he makes he's an entire career of trying to pick apart the Bible. He does a terrible job of it, but it's convincing enough for popular consumption to read. And around Easter time, people will go and they used to do this when Larry King, is Larry King still alive? Yes, no, I, I don't think I, 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 he should be dead probably. I, I think. I mean, he's. He's very old. He's very old because 20 some years ago, he was old to me that I think he's probably deceased. Anyways, um, there used to be Larry King would have on these different guys from what we call the Jesus seminar. Jesus seminar took place a few decades back where you had these uh, so-called scholars get together and they, they got together and they determined what did Jesus actually say? So they went through the gospel records and said, well, Jesus probably said this. He probably said this. And they vote using different colored marbles. It was ridiculous. It was absolutely insane. If you really take a look at it objectively, the point is that Larry King would have around Easter time, just as now you, know, you see people get interviewed and people still read Newsweek or time. I don't know if they still do that, but you, you interview these people and they say, who is Jesus? And then you get these individuals who show up and they, they seem very clever, very smart, very intellectual. And they'll say, well, Jesus was a myth. He's a, he's a myth, the Christ myth. And they'll appeal to meta narrative, psychological patterns. Saying, oh, well, every culture needs a hero. And the hero, the Jewish culture was the Christ. Well, you can look at Jesus's life and ministry and realize it doesn't seem like a very likely hero who gets crucified. The point is though, people have these different strange ideas. Who Jesus is, it's no different today than it was 2000 years ago. People have different ideas about who Jesus is. Matthew 26, this is where it starts getting pretty dark. When Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came up to him with an alabaster flask of very expensive ointment, and she poured it on his head as he reclined at table. And when the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, why this waste? Now, I want you to think one specific disciple, if you know this account, think one specific disciple who probably said, why this waste? Okay. For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. In pouring this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. Truly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. So, you know, if you have expectations of Jesus, that Jesus, as, as he goes, and this is, this is, this is, towards a point of just great climax in this gospel record where you have Jesus and he is heading into Jerusalem and you're thinking, okay, if, if my hope is that Jesus is the Christ and my picture of the Christ is one who is going to overthrow uh, an earthly government and somebody is going to make my life wonderful here and now, he's going to give me everything I wanted and let me sit on a throne next to him. And you hear him say these things and he is entertaining a woman that you want nothing to do with, even though you, you may be somebody that has a history, has a past, you feel like, well, you're on the right side now. Jesus is here and, and, and Jesus is popular and I'm going to be popular with him. And you see somebody come along, I like, oh, don't want anything to do with her. I don't want her identified with me in any capacity. And she comes in and she does something and seems very wasteful to you and wasteful to you, not necessarily because you were concerned about the money being spent on the poor. But because deep down in your heart, you have this desire that you use Jesus for personal gain. And this happens still today. That people look at Jesus and say, you know what? It's, it's Jesus gains influence and power, so I will gain influence and power in our culture. 
And if I can just position myself, I can just position my church, if I can just position my ministry in such a way that I can exercise influence, then behind the scenes, it's the, oh man, that means I can, I can do it. I mean, I can talk about Jesus as being the one who gets this position, but that means good things for me, right? That was the mentality of a man named Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. And then this happens. One of the twelve, whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid him thirty pieces of silver. And from that moment, he sought an opportunity to betray him. So the reasoning here, what's going on, is Judas thinks, I thought I knew who Jesus was. And now the pressure point has been touched for me. And I have come to the realization that Jesus is not going to do for me what I want him to do for me. And instead of being corrected and let him tell me who he is and define what I should seek and pursue, I will take the opportunity in my disillusionment from Jesus to sell him. If I can't get personal gain from Jesus directly, I'll get personal gain by selling him away. I'm not going to go into the ways this happened, but it's, it's pretty obvious, pretty obvious to most of us. We see people use Jesus for personal gain in a way that's not right, a way that reflects Judas saying, I can sell Jesus, I can market Jesus for personal gain instead of let him define who he is. Finally, we have this account. At the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? And they all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So this escalates escalates socially. This, this isn't just somebody who has personal doubts at this point. This is an escalation where people have said, ha ha, this Jesus threatens me. This Jesus threatens my sense of entitlement. This Jesus threatens my self-righteousness. This Jesus threatens my religious performance. And he is exposing me for who I am. And he's telling me, there's only hope to be found if I have a righteousness that exceeds anything else that can be performed by people. Meaning there's only a righteousness that's available that looks to him. He said, light is coming to the world to expose things that are done and are evil. That's everywhere. He's, he's said this and he has said that if anyone looks to him, just like the, the people of Israel looked at this bronze serpent that Moses raised up to stop this outbreak. If anybody looks on him, he won't be condemned. And, and Jesus has said this, and we just don't like this because we are very, very sure that we are good. And this Jesus makes us feel really uncomfortable. And so the ultimate response that we see to not understanding who Jesus is, not understanding how the Bible points to who Jesus is, who he actually is, and what he came to do. The ultimate response is what we celebrated, and is a celebration because it is the finished work of Jesus that we look at on Good Friday, but it's the, the events of Good Friday, Jesus' crucifixion. That is the culmination of every missed expectation of Jesus, where people say, you know what? You can't do for me what I want you to do for me, so it's time to get rid of you. And I would caution any of us 
to be very careful that when we when we encounter things that are difficult and you will encounter things that are difficult, you have encountered things that are difficult. And as you live in this fallen world, you will continue to encounter things that are difficult. I would caution you against this temptation that you will face, that I face, that all of us face this temptation to look at God and say, I I just don't know that I can trust you to do, to do good for me. I just don't know that I can trust you for that because Things aren't playing out the way that I would like. And all you have to do is look at the the interactions of Jesus with people in the gospel records and you see how, how merciful he is to people in ways that they don't necessarily know they need. And it's caution us to say, don't fall prey to the same temptation that the people who ultimately crucified Jesus fell into. Let Jesus set his own standard of who he is for you. You don't need to add anything to it or change anything for him. So continuing on, clear as clear can be. So verses 22 through 27, back in Luke 24, moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. And when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So as Jesus interacts with these confused disciples, he graciously tells them that the crucifixion and resurrection should not have surprised them because he promised it personally and through the scriptures. Now, we looked at this the other week, so I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. But I, I just want you to be reminded that as you track through the gospel record and, and as we move to, to land the plane of this message later on to look at how you know the Apostle Paul kind of unfolds the significance of the gospel for people, I just I want you to be reminded again that this is not a mistake. This is not an accident. This is not a second plan that God had. Like, oh, it looks like things failed or, oh, looks like Jesus is going to die now, so I'm going to have to do something to like fix that. This whole thing has been clear. It's been clear. I mean, all you have to do, go back to Genesis. And the promise is made of the seed of the woman who is going to have the the serpent. He's he's going to snag his heel. He's going to be wounded. The seed of the woman is is going to suffer a wound. And yet that same heel is going to crush the serpent's head. I mean, this is, this is a promise way back at the beginning. And so all you have to do is you look at that through the lens of Jesus and you think, oh, that makes sense now. It makes sense. What, what, what is this about a serpent and, a, and a, the seed of the woman? What is this? That's Jesus. Matthew 26 while he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man, seize him. And he came up to Jesus at once and said, Greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you came to do. And they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, put your sword back into its place for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day, I sat in the temple teaching and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him and fled. So as Judas, as Judas goes into this place of betrayal, as he, as he pursues Jesus' life in this betrayal, you have his disciples are saying, oh, this is not going to work. And you think back to Peter saying, far be it from you, Lord, to be crucified. Far be it from you to do this. This is, this is, this is insanity. Don't do this. And so here you have Judas betraying Jesus And Jesus says to the people, to his disciples and to those who have come to arrest him, don't you think that I could get away from this if I wanted to? Don't you think? And yet he he makes a very clear point. He said, it's necessary that this happens so that everything promised in the Bible would happen. 
He, he doesn't say, well, I came up with this idea like yesterday and I think it's going to work now. He said, I have to be betrayed and I have to die and I have to be raised on the third day in order that the stuff written about me in this book might be fulfilled. Okay, it's very important that we understand this. Very important, you see, this the cross is not a second plan. It's not a backup plan. It's not any type of a a, a failed approach that 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 you know. Oh, it could have been different, but it just didn't work out. It's not it. This has all been planned. It's all been ordered. It's all been put into motion. As as Peter is preaching at Pentecost, he says, "You know what? This Jesus whom you crucified was delivered up by the the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. This was planned from all of eternity." And so you look through the Bible, and as Jesus says to them, like, you foolish ones, you're so slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken, because he says, look through this book, look through your Bible, even the Old Testament, and you're going to see I'm all over the place. The problem is you're just not looking for it. And I would suggest that the primary reason the primary reason that we miss Jesus throughout the Old Testament and then even going into the New Testament, people get weird cockamamie ideas about bizarre prophecy charts and things like that. The reason is because we don't want what Jesus wants to give us. We don't want what Jesus wants to give us. And this is where we're not unlike the, the people that re responded to Jesus as you walking around this earth. We're not unlike them because they wanted things from Jesus. He didn't give them those things. And so they come over and I guess, uh, I guess this is just not reliable. But if you see, this is, you know, you, the, the, the memory passage for this week, when God says to Isaiah, I am he who for my own sake blots out your transgressions. You hear God saying this thing. Oh, this sounds like it's probably pretty important to God if he's doing it for his own sake, right? He's saying, this is so important to me. I'm doing it. You don't deserve it, but I'm doing it for my own sake. Hmm. This seems to be a priority. And so you hear these disciples telling Jesus, you know what? We thought, we thought he was going to be the one to redeem Israel. I guess we were wrong. And yet the whole book points to a redeemer who would have to suffer, a redeemer who would not come to just give you a little spit and shine to make you better, but a redeemer who would have to come and who would have to lay down his life for you because you are that awful. You're that evil. And yet you are that loved. Say in 53, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. So the same Isaiah, the same prophet who says on God's behalf that God's going to blot out his people's sins for his own sake is the same one who says, here's how it's going to happen. Here's how it's going to happen. This deliverer, this redeemer will come and it's going to be the will of God to crush him. It'll be the will of God to crush him. And yet, even in that crushing, as his soul makes an offering for guilt, as this redeemer comes and as he lays down his life, he is going to see and he is going to be satisfied with the finished nature of that work. And so as the resurrection occurs, it is a testament to the fact that this work is finished and that this redeemer looks on his work and says, it's done and it is good and my people are mine. This whole book has pointed forward to this promise because from the garden and we messed up and we failed and all of us are born with this nasty, disgusting nature of self-centeredness from birth. And yet God promises, I'm going to do something for you. There's just other people like you. And if you don't see that your biggest problem is that you're alienated from the God who made you, if you don't see that the solution to that is not to make yourself better, but it's to trust in this finished work, you're missing the whole point. 
So we're going to finish with this here. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Really long statement here, but here's what I want you to know, because I thought if I can give you a really long sentence, really long sentence that summarizes the gospel, I'll do it for you. Okay. And this might sound kind of like verbiage I would use. You can modify it. Just don't change the content because we don't want to mess around with the gospel. But I want to give this to you. The whole Bible is about a God who glorifies himself by redeeming sinful people for himself, by sending his son to lay his life down for those who will, by the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit, turn from living in sinful rebellion against him and find in him their righteousness, I should say righteousness, their righteousness, treasure, and everything else. So that's a long sentence, but I, I want you to see in this just a couple of things. First of all, that this work we talk about, we talk about the gospel, we talk about being a gospel-centered church, talk about being gospel-centered people. It can be a buzzword, but I want you to understand what this means in relationship to this resurrection of Jesus and how Jesus is talking to these disciples because he thinks it's pretty important that they understand this. And so I think it's pretty important that we understand it. And that if the, the Bible points to this and Jesus is, is so intent on saying, here's how everything talks about me, that we need to understand, okay, well, what, what does it mean for everything to point to Jesus? What does it mean for everything to talk about Jesus that we read in the Bible? What we have to see is that this is, first of all, God is at the center of this. Right? Jesus doesn't go to the disciples and say to them, let me, let me tell you, let me tell you about the wonderful plan I have for your life. He doesn't say that. He's, he starts with the beginning, he starts with Moses, and he points them to him. It's very easy, it's very tempting for us to look at the Bible and think, you know what, I, just, I don't think that I need to focus so much on knowing who God is. I guess I, I got that, right? Like God is, God is love. That's all I need to know. Well, you, you can get some weird relational issues with people if you think that you have reached Pontus Terminus with them. I finished knowing you. That's it. And Jesus wants you to know him. He wants you to know who he is. He wants, he wants to, as it were, take you through your Bible and point you to him. Just like he did with these disciples. And if we understand that the, the New Testament is written, we have promises made. This is the most it's a really helpful thing. Mark Dever, pastor, Capitol Baptist in Washington, D.C., has, has, a, has like two big, thick kind of, we'll call them commentaries. Uh, they're they're entry-level type commentaries that give you big picture overviews. And he, he preached through each book of the Bible. It's kind of like a one sermon type deal, preaching through it. But he has it broken down. His Old Testament says, his Old Testament commentary says, promises made. And the New Testament is promises kept. Promises made, promises kept. And so we, we look at the Bible, we understand, all right, the New Testament isn't something necessarily new. It's everything promised here it looks to Jesus. And then the well, New Testament is, explains it, explains it, helps us unfold it, understand it. And so what I think Jesus is jealous for, and what I want us to be jealous for, is, is to just have the reputation as people and have the reputation as a church to, to not be... To not be like the church that does bleh, like bleh. The church that does this. Because when you start going here, or you start going here, what you're doing is, is you're, 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 you're giving people something else to be focused on that is not what Jesus wants his church to be focused on. So if you can be the church that has really great music, and music is important. I love music. Okay. This church has really great music. And you just focus so much on that, so much on that. Well, you're going to get people who like really great music, but that's not going to be the thing that keeps people there. 
And you can be the church that has really nice people, and you should be really nice people. And I know you're really nice people, and I love you, and that's great. But if, if you just focus on that, it's going to be people there. I mean, this is what I grew up with, a church of really nice people. Got people there, really nice people. But Jesus left the building a long time prior. And so what Jesus wants us to do is look at, look at this, look at my word, and look for me. Look for me. And so I just want to use a couple things here. The Apostle Paul says, as is, is he, is he helps churches do this, he helps churches do on a corporate level what Jesus does for these disciples on the road to Emmaus. To this church at Colossae, Paul says, Therefore, that no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. That no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by a sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head from the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with the growth that is from God. This is, I, I just, it, it breaks my heart when I think this, 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 you know, just say it by names, whatever, it's not a surprise, Bethel Church out in Redding, California. They have this thing, Bethel Supernatural School of Ministry or something like that. And they've, they've made it their, their aim to attract young people, like 18 through 22, to come to this place, this supposed school of supernatural ministry, to learn how to work miracles. And, and they gather people there, and they have this terrible reputation in their community because they'll go out and they'll do very strange things, very bizarre things. And, and they'll, they'll hurt a lot of people. By making certain promises to them, it is weird things. Okay, weird things, and and I just share that as an example because first of all, it's very visible, very public. Right? Bethel music is a big deal. Okay, but I say that because the Apostle Paul is talking to a church here that was tempted to just be led along with this idea. Okay, you know what? Starting with Jesus is good, but there's got to be something more. Gospel entry, right? There's your ticket entry, but now you're inside here, and then there's just there's a whole lot more. So there's so much better, so much more for you to experience. It isn't focused on Jesus, and so the reputation of Bethel Church is not a church that loves Jesus and helps other people to know and love Jesus. It's a church that focuses on miracles, and the Apostle Paul would say, "Knock it off." He says specifically here to this church at Colossae, don't let people go on with talk about having visions or hanging out with angels or whatever, because guess what it's going to do? You're going to get real puffed up, real conceited, real fast. He'll probably start a cult. Instead, focus on Christ because he is the substance, meaning all the shadows of the Old Testament were promises, substance, kept, promises kept in Jesus. Focus on him. See him at the center of all things, church. That is what Paul is saying to the church at Colossae. In Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, we're going to finish with this. I want this again to kind of call you to action. Paul says, He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Paul likes really long sentences. I like really long sentences. Might be hard for you to track, so I'll just kind of break this down a little bit easier way. What Paul is saying here is, you know what? All the different ways that God has equipped the church, all the different ways that God has given to the church, whether it's the apostles in the first century or whether it's these different individuals that God has put in your life, whether it's a pastor or whether it's somebody who is given to the task of church planting and going establishing churches in, in unreached areas, these different things God has given to the, the church, they're, they're for one reason. One reason. It's so that the church might grow in maturity as it holds fast to Jesus that the church might grow maturity in knowing this Jesus and seeing him at the center of all things. That's why. Okay, my job exists to help you do that. 
My job exists to equip you for the work of ministry. My job equips so that you see Jesus clearly and that you live in such a way that reflects Jesus clearly. That's what I do. And your job as a Christian is to say, I need to see Jesus at the center of everything. I need to know him. And I need other people to know him through me. That's your job as a Christian. If it were not your job as a Christian, the Lord would would evaporate you up into the air. It's like, all right, well, no more fallen world for you. Life's better up here. But that's not his plan for his church. His plan for his church is to, as the, the song we sang earlier, get up, church, arise, put your armor on. There's work for you to do. And that work consists in you seeing Jesus on every page of your Bible, of you drawing near to meet with him and saying, Lord, I need to know you because it's going to help me grow maturity. I'm going to live in a way toward other people. It's going to help them grow maturity. We're all going to grow maturity together. And it's going to be wonderful and great because we're going to see you and you're the whole point of everything. And your whole word talks about you as the point of everything. I want other people to see you as the point of everything. That's your job. That's our job together as Christian people in a fallen world. So we do. Do what Jesus did at Roman Mace. Point people to him. Point people to him. Point people to Jesus. Worship team, please come on up. We're going to pray. And we're going to close with a few songs. Help us reflect on just how beautiful the centrality of Jesus is. Father, we thank you for giving us your word. Thank you for inspiring for hundreds of years those who would point forward the coming of your son and by your spirit write truthfully and after the coming of your son these men whom you've given the task of writing your word down to write faithfully is a gift you've given to us we thank you for it i pray that you would please help us see with clarity to see jesus at the center to see you the triune god father son and holy spirit to see you as the one to be adored and worshipped as the main character of history. And that we as a church would be known for that. We'd have a reputation for that, Lord. That, that's just my sincere desire. I, I, I don't want us to be a wealthy church. I don't want us to be the beautiful church. I don't want us to be the friendly church. I want us to be the gospel-centered church. That's where people will find you. So would you please lead us now? Lord, lead us now to see you as we sing, as we worship you together in song. We ask this, Father, for Jesus' sake. Amen.